Good afternoon. My name is Ulf Isra and I'm from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. And I'm here to talk about fundamental physics on the space station. I guess I'm getting a pointer up here, too. No? Um, this, the fundamental physics that we're doing uh, or planning to do is primarily at, on the attached uh, payload uh, spots on the outside of the station, but there's also some inside. So even though this is the attached payload session, we do have some work on the inside of the space station to plan. Um, as with material science and the other disciplines, we had a, quite a substantial program planned for space station research uh, earlier in this decade, and with a refocusing of activities onto exploration. Okay. Um, I think you lose your mic. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, the, the activities were severely curtailed, like for the other disciplines, and we're just now starting to get back into um, doing some, you know, getting something started on the space station. And, and, and li like with material science, we are also focusing our efforts to work with the European partners, and they, they have a much stronger program in fundamental physics, and we are working with them to sort of get the NASA program started back up again. Next, please. These are the um, <clears throat> main topics I'll be discussing today. Just uh, a bit of an introduction about where physics stand today, physics in the 21st century. What are some of the open questions and some of the excitement? Um, I'll talk about laboratory versus observational physics. There's actually two parts of NASA that do work in uh, fundamental physics. Uh, the science mission directorate do mainly observational physics, and the exploration mission directorate or the operations mission directorate do laboratory physics. Talk about the benefits of space experimentation <coughs> for physics, um, some of the planned experiments and, and activities, a little bit about technology and conclusions. Next, please. Okay, it's quite an exciting time to be a physicist, actually. There's, there's, you know, as we probe the universe and learn more things, we realize that you know, the more we learn, the more we realize that we know so little. So the one thing, you know, over the, 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 the last century, the two breakthrough um, physics discoveries were the, the theories of uh, gravitation, Albert Einstein's relativity theories, and quantum mechanics. I mean, those are the two foundational theories of nature today that sort of describes how, how things are put together. And we do know that they actually don't work well together. I mean, they, in fact, at, when you look at the limit of gravity at the small scale or quantum mechanics at a larger scale, they don't line up. There's something wrong. There's, there's a deeper understanding of nature that is there for us to discover. So that's, you know, <clears throat> it's pretty motivational. I think when, when this conflict is resolved, a different view of reality may come about, really change our thinking about who we are and, and what the universe is all about. Another clue to that something is really a miss out there is that recent cosmological observations show that we only know about 4% of the energy content of the universe. That's, that's in the form of planets and galaxies and things of that sort. 23% is in the form of some unknown dark matter, it's called. And 73% is in the form of an unknown dark energy that actually is accelerating and ripping the universe apart. So these are all really pointing to the fact that there's lots of interest in physics to discover out there. Next, please. <coughs> so in the early 2000, I think it was 2002, there was a, um, a uh, study commission that, that was an, an interagency uh, commission. There were participants from the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Science and Technology, the Department of Energy, and NASA. And they were looking at, you know, they were engaging the physics community and asking them, you know, what are the big things that we should be doing in the next uh, century, basically. And the commission came up with a report called Connecting Quarks with the Cosmos. And they came up with 11 questions that sort of um, is um, the beacons for what physicists are, are, are trying to understand. So the, the 11 questions are shown here. Shown in yellow is um, what we think the exploration program, the space station program, can help address. 
So five out of, the, out of the 11 questions, we think by doing experimentation on the space station, we can learn about those questions. And they are, what's the dark matter? You know, what is this thing that we, we can see is out there, but we don't know what it is? What's the nature of the dark energy? <clears throat> Did Einstein have the last word on gravity? So by testing gravity to ultimate precision on the space station, we can actually you know, probe the limits of that and see, hopefully see at some point where it starts to break down and, and, and see the hints of, an, of, an, of a more profound underlying theory. <clears throat> Related to that is questions about, you know, are the protons unstable? You know that neutrons decay into protons, but protons tend to at be, be stable over the length scale of you know, most of the life of the universe, but they may not be perfectly stable. So if there's a, a tiny instability in them, it, it has profound implications about, about the standard model of physics. Are there additional space-time dimensions out there? All these theories that try to combine gravity with quantum mechanics, like string theory and, and, and brain theory and things of that sort, they come up with um, a requirement that there are, are other dimensions out there. And we haven't yet seen them, but there's experiments underway to, to probe for these things. So these are all, all <coughs> things that um, we, be, we look forward to helping to understand. It on, and like I said, the yellow ones, the, the ones I read off are research that can be done on the space station. Next, please. So the question about um, laboratory versus observational physics. Um, observational physics as, is, um, really the domain of the, the science mission directorate. So it's another part of NASA that do big observatories that they send out to space. They do things like the WMAP or COBE, Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer, and they do telescopes to look at what's out there, like way out there, and, and, and try to learn from what they see at the beginning of time, for example, and, and try to, to uh, draw out physics from, the, from, from those. Um, it's really a domain on, on what's called the Beyond Einstein program at, at NASA headquarters, although it's, I think it's changed now. It's called Physics of the Cosmos now. But they look at things like gravity waves. You know, that's a big thing. I mean, we know Einstein is telling us that they should be there, but we haven't yet seen them directly. So there's big plans to do, uh, <coughs> uh, do uh, ma major experiments out there to look for, for gravity wave signals. They would do uh, strong gravity tests of relativity surveys of dark energy, looking out there, you know, what's the, what can we learn about dark energy by, by observing the universe? Search, searches of dark matter, CMB measurements, which is cosmic microwave background radiation measurements, and looking for high energy cosmic rays. These are all things that are observational in nature. You, you look at what's happening out in the universe and you try to deduce physics from that. What we're more concerned with here and in the space station program although they can do some observational physics too, you're probably gonna hear about that at, at, after my talk. But m my talk really focusing on laboratory physics, which is the domain of the Exploration Mission Directorate and the Operations Mission Directorate. So it, it's really studies of matter, space, and time using laboratories in space. We bring the stuff up there that we're studying, the test mass, we bring it up with us and we look at it under conditions in, of microgravity. And it's things like gravitational physics, critical phenomena, and physics beyond the standard model. <clears throat> Next, please. So what are some of the benefits um, by doing things out in space? What's shown here is um, an experiment we did in 1980, mid-1980s. Mid um, it's called the Lambda Point Experiment, and it flew on, on the cargo bay of the space shuttle. Um, in space, we have access to significant variations in the gravitational potential and, and other accelerations. Uh, we have greatly reduced non-gravitational sources of noise. It's a very quiet, quiescent environment that you can take advantage of. You can have access to very large distances, large velocities, and large separations between uh, your test, test masses, for example. You can also have access to vacuum conditions of space. Those are kind of new, unique uh, benefits for fundamental physics experiment. We have you heard other disciplines talk about other um, fe features of the microgravity environment also, but these are the ma main ones for physics. Uh, next, please. So, um, <clears throat> we, our program is organized into two different areas, basically. One is the very, very much basic research, the very fundamental part of it, and it's 
in, in that program, we try to discover and explore fundamental laws governing matter, space, and time. So th those are, you know, that's at the forefront of things. I mean, it's really understanding, you know, what, what lies beneath general relativity and, and quantum mechanics. What's the, the next level of unifying laws that, that we, we know is out there? So it's, it, it's this, a simple thing, it's a simplistic approach. I mean, we know that the laws of physics are very simple at the bottom, and we try to get to the, the, the simplest one that describes the universe as we know it. On the other side, <coughs> even though the laws of physics at the bottom end are very simple, the world that we see is very complex. So there's sort of an organizing principles that come into play, even though you start with these simple laws and things turn into very complex. So that's another thing we want to explore to discover these organizing principles from, from which we get all the structure and complexity. And as you know, or probably do know, with physics, um, it's taught at all the universities. It's sort of a very foundational uh, pursuit. So it, by, by addressing these two, two activities in, in space, we hope to fulfill the innate human desire to really understand what our role is and what, what this place called the universe is all about. But in doing so, we also build the foundation for, for tomorrow's breakthrough technologies. Because physicists, to do an experiment better than done before, you need new technology. So technology and, and physics go hand in hand. <coughs> and we see it all the time in our program. Uh, next, please. <coughs> OK, so this is, um, again, looking at a little bit more detail about these um, long-term questions that are out there. Um, so solving the mystery of gravity, we know gravity is a very precise, it's, it stood to, it, it's, you know, all the tests done so far has verified gravity and verified Einstein's general relativity. But we know it's gonna break down at some point. So this is kind of what can be done out in space. The, ter the top two bullets are observational physics only, I'm not gonna talk about those. But the, the ones again shown in yellow are things we can do in laboratory physics experiments on the space station. <clears throat> so, um, one way to search for gr uh, breakdown in, in general relativity is to, to test the inverse square law of, of uh, gravity. And we can do it at distances from submillimeter to, to larger scales. On the space station, you can do submillimeter experiments where you just take up um, uh, a test, test mass technique, for example, and just probe how, you know, uh, when you get down in down into uh, separations between like plates of less than one millimeter, do you, is, the, is the inverse square, square law still, still um, accurate? And you can also do it out to planetary scales, but it does need, you need much more complicated equipment to do that. You can have one station at the, at the space station, but then you have to have a satellite way out there to look at those kind of separations. Another way, um, to test gravity is to test the sort of foundational principle of gravity, which is the Einstein's equivalence principle. And it basically says that if you drop two things, um, they're gonna fall at the same rate. That's really as, as simple as, as it is. And there's a picture you may have seen out there where, where um, Galileo Galilei dropped a cannonball and something else from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to measure if they hit the ground at the same time. And that's a test of the equivalence principle. <clears throat> and you can also do um, tests of other, other parts of relativity in the solar, solar system. So these are all things that we can do um, on the space station. Next, please. And looking at it from, from the other end, the standard model of physics has three, combines three forces. It has its and we, we know of four forces in the, in, in, in the universe. One is gravity, and the three other ones are the electromagnetic force and the strong and weak nuclear force. But those three, the non-gravitational force, are all combined into something we call the standard model of physics. So as I said, you know, we know that there's something missing, something, you know, it, it's, gravity doesn't fit in, so either we have to modify the standard model or we have to modify gravity or we have to modify both. Uh, one way to do, do that is to, um, again, the yellow indicates things that we could do on the space station in laboratory tests. The top one is something that they can do. Um, the science mission directorate can do by observational physics. If the proton decays, uh, it, it tells, us, tells us unique information about the unification of forces. And we can do an experiment 
of measuring the electron dipole moment of an electron on the space station at very high precision. They will give us a, a much stringent, more stringent bound than we can do with any, any type of measurement on the ground. Uh, special relativity, is that valid under all conditions? Um, if you recall in special relativity, Einstein talked about clock experiments a lot, both in special and general relativity, in fact. But uh, so we can use clock experiments to look at, you know, is, is the position of your clock totally independent? That's a local position invariance test. Um, the Europeans have a, a plan to do, fly something called the atomic clock ensemble in space. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. They, we will be, uh, NASA has a, will be, uh, partnering with the European Space Agency on doing some experiments on that. <clears throat> Our nature's constant, really constant. Um, if you take two different clocks and operate them in space, and, and where the, the, prin the, 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 the principle behind the clock op operation uh, is, is the, if you take a clock that, that's, that's based on like a cesium transition, for example, like an atomic clock, you take another clock that's based on, on the dimensional stability of a material, of a material like a, a microwave resonator or something. They're very different materials, and you get the same, you know, you get the same kind of clock signal. If if you watch those two, you can get bounds on uh, time dependence of the fine structure constant, for example. And you can also look at um, have different clocks and get measurements about the isotropy of the speed of light. You know, is it the same in all, all dimensions? Is that me? Going on. I think it's my clock and my, my phone. Okay, the last one here, are there compacted unseen dimensions? And I think that's, that's what all indications are. People that are trying to unify uh, the forces of nature, they come up with that. I mean, they come up with up to 11 dimensions is the, the best uh, models that they, that they have today. And they're saying that we, we only see three of them plus time because as the universe was born, these other dimensions never grew. So they're, they're compact, they're, they're, they're existing right here and now with us, so they're right here other dimensions, but we can't see them because they're so small. So one way you can test that, if you do these um, inverse square law measurements at, at small separations, when you get down to a separation where these dimensions exist, you will see a deviation from the one over square law. So that's, again, a very potent experiment you can do on the space station that can really, you know, perhaps let us see these unseen dimensions. Next, please. So what's the dark matter? That's another uh, experiment. It's mostly observational physics because they can map the distribution of galaxies and kind of see w by gravity uh, where the dark matter exists. But we can also do, um, th there, there are certain theories that, that, uh, that impact, uh, again, variation, lead to variations in the, the Newton's force law, the one over, over R squared force law. And there's a particular par particle called the axion. If the axion exists, it will modify uh, the one over R squared force, which again, you can measure with the, the test cell in, in space. And you can also imagine doing, uh, searching for other relics of the Big Bang by being out there on the space station and looking for things. Next, please. Okay, shifting gear now, talking about some of the, the planned activities we have. I mentioned the, the ACES clock experiment. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's putting a, an atomic clock, a cesium atomic clock, it's a European experiment with a French investigator, French PI. The, it, it's uh, a cesium atomic clock that's, that's, cap that's uh, stable to one part in 10 to the 16 that's put on the space station. It's on the, it's on the Columbus, uh, one of the Col Columbus uh, attached points, external attached points. The, it will be sit, sitting there and, and transmitting time down to the Earth at that level. So it has, it has a very accurate clock, it has a very accurate time trans, transfer capability, and you'll be using ground stations uh, five or six. They're still planning, you know, laying out the, the detailed plans for that. But they will be receiving these signals, and they will be also be interconnected across the globe. So it's, it's a very collective time transfer experiment 
there will be some, uh, at least one ground station in the US somewhere, and NASA is in the process of selecting that. So the Europeans would give to NASA the microwave link, and we have some kind of barter agreement to, to, um, to work that. <clears throat> so it'll, it's a clock that's uh, stable to about a part in 10 to the 16, um, and it, it will use the clock to do both tests of general and special relativity to a very high accuracy. Um, of course, the relevance for that is, is listed here. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very basic science experiment, so it leads, it leads to understanding about fundamental laws of nature, but it's also it's very technology-oriented because you use lasers and, and these kind of things in a variety of, of activities, and you can use them for space exploration activities such as autonomous navigation or, or free flying, formation flying. Clocks are really very important for many aspects of, you know, all aspects of exploration and, and other things. Um, so I think I sort of talked about the, the approach. It's likely to be a JPL clock. We're, we're, the NASA hasn't quite co completed with the selection process, but this, pro this, this chart probably, probably shouldn't have said JPL here, but that's likely where it, it might be. The launch for ACES is planned in 2013, and it's about one and a half year long operational phase. Next, please. Alex or Alex Lehoski talked about uh, the Declic uh, CNES uh, hardware. There's actually um, quite a few different inserts that they have built. The French have built for the for the Declic. And one is called the Ali insert. And it, it's, it's, an, it's, it's a, an insert where you can do critical phenomena experiments. And um, there'll be, we're in, in the process of selecting a US PI to work with the Europeans on accomplishing um, an experiment on there too. It'll be coming up uh, in 2011. It, it'll be run, run for about six months. Um, but critical phenomena, it, it's sort of, um, uh, it's a very precise test bed system, basically. So you can use it if you if you you, you, tr you try to understand the simplest systems that you can. And critical uh, critical phenomena is is one of those systems. Um, you can you can use it to as a test bed, and, and and once you understand that, you can extrapolate to other theories. There's a Nobel Prize winning theory that that is used to predict this behavior, and, and we want to test it to the best precision possible. Once, you, once you've tested it, you can apply it to other systems. Um, okay, next please. Another thing we have planned is to uh, release a NASA research announcement in fundamental physics um, in 2011 and select some investigators in 2012. Again, this is linking into the European Space Agency activities, just like the ACES clock experiment is. So they, the Europeans have a plan to, to do a follow-on experiment to the ACES experiment. It'll be either a very advanced uh, optical clock, or it will be an atom interferometry type um, experiment. He's sh showing here an, uh, a strontium clock concept that the Europeans are working on. And this is a drop tower based uh, atom interferometer. Um, so the plan is to, to have a workshop in, in the fall. We, we actually we're looking at uh, October right now. It, it, this chart is outdated, it said August to September, but we, we're having a workshop plan October 12 to 15 to um, engage the U.S. community and, and help, you know, get their inputs to what should be in the, the NASA research announcement, basically. So that's a collaboration we started working with the Europeans, and we'll see how that goes. Next, please. Okay, physics and technology. I uh, just want to say a few words about that, too. Um, like I said a little bit before, I mean, any time you do a very carefully thought-out physics experiment, you know, the technology, you often have to improve also. So anybody that comes up with a new experiment, it can be on the ground. If you, if you, if you have a, you know, if, if you want to do something better than anybody else has done, it needs new technology. So they really go hand in hand. 
And especially when to do something in space is very costly. And to really do an experiment on the space station, you would hope that you can achieve something that's at least one to two orders of magnitude, magnitude better than what you can do on the ground. But that means your technology has to be that much better also. So they really do go hand, hand in hand. <coughs> and these technologies, I mean, they may take a long time, but they eventually do find their way into uh, the market, the competitive market. Uh, and you can look at you know, what has come out of physics labs in the past. I mean, the laser was an invention back in, I don't know when, like in the 40s, I think, 40s or 50s. Um, nuclear magnetic resonance or magnetic resonance imaging was, again, done by physicists in the lab to, to help, um, to try to understand what's going on in, in, in atoms. And now we, we use them, you know, to, to image the human body and to, to help avoid diseases and stuff like that. Computer devices, the World Wide Web, other examples of things that, you know, it was done for physics reasons, but then you, you find the applications later on. Atomic clocks, uh, global positioning system, I mean, where would be, we be today without that? But, uh, you know, it was, it come from somewhere. <clears throat> um, another point to make here is that even, even scientific insight may lead to application. You don't know where it's gonna come from, but once you understand the nature in a new way, and you can, uh, you can model it, and you can sort of describe it, you can use that to manipulate things. So you can then manipulate that that concept and, and perhaps uh, help it to support some other societal needs, some other technology. So all these examples I mentioned above here, they started out as new physics at some point and, and the progression from the concept stage, the new, new idea stage to mature application can sometimes take decades. But I think it's clear even today that the physics that we do today is really the foundation for tomorrow's uh, breakthrough technologies. Next, please. So here's some examples of technologies uh, that have come out of this program and that we're still working on today. Um, we have in our labs and uh, plans to do it on, on space too, uh, atomic clocks that are stable to one part in 10 to the 17. And that represents a stability that if you started that clock when the universe was born, it would be off by five seconds today. We have a high resolution thermometry that, that's accurate to a few parts in 10 to the 11 at around two Kelvin. And that's so accurate that you in principle, if you had a, a body to, to measure, which you can actually devise, you can in principle detect the cooling of the cosmic microwave background radiation due to the expansion of the universe. As the universe expands, it cools. It's, it's cooled down to about 2.7 Kelvin right now. And the rate of cool down is such that you could, with, with a thermometer like that, you can actually detect it directly. Atom interferometry, I haven't really talked about them too much, but that's the, the subject of uh, the NASA research announcement that we will be releasing. <clears throat> They're intrinsically about 10 orders of magnitude more sensitive to any inertial force than light interferometers. It's just because they have, they have a, quite a mass. The photon doesn't have any mass. The atom has a lot of mass. <clears throat> They don't require any cryogenic cooling, and they're microscopic quantum particles, so you can, uh, they're really ideal uh, test masses. It provides a drag-free test mass measurement without a drag-free satellite, so you can do it without um, complicated satellite structures to, to sort of fly around your test mass if you do high precision measurements. And it's much more sensitive if you operate it in zero gravity. So there's a lot of benefits from use, doing these things in space. I put an, another thing down here that's, uh, uh, it's called a low gravity simulator. And it's, uh, it's utilizing the fact that any, um, any substance with a magnetic susceptibility, like water, for example, or like a mouse in this case, which is mostly water or a human, uh, you, you, can, you can create a magnetic field gradient that precisely cancels uh, the force due to gravity on the ground. So you can actually make essentially a zero gravity environment in, in your test, in a test sample on the ground. And, and th this, is a, this is about, um, 
maybe an inch and a half diameter. So it's a, it's a small mouse here. But it, this mouse is actually free flying in the laboratory on the ground. And this is uh, the, the same kind of thing with the, the water bu bubble, water drop in there. So you can actually make these things. And we, we've, we've studied, we've made the measurements on, on superfluid helium in our laboratory and, and verified that you can get down to about um, uh, 15 millig effective gravity in your test sample. <clears throat> Next, please. So before I conclude, I probably should have ended on this, but before it, it didn't, it's not last. So. Uh, just a few comments from some of the greatest thinkers uh, today. Actually, Richard Feynman, of course, is dead, but Stephen Hawking is still alive. About where we are with physics. I mean, I think it's a great time for to be a physicist. There's, you know, like Stephen Hawking is saying, there are grounds for cautious optimism that we may now be near the end of the search for the ultimate laws of nature. So you really can see it, I mean, in, in his research and in what he's realizing. You can see the connections being made between quantum mechanics and gravity, and, and it's, it's coming. And a quote from Richard Feynman, <coughs> this sort of get, goes to the, the point of org organizational principles and even the fact that you know, the laws of nature may be very simple at the, at the foundational level, but they get, you know, they, it, the universe that we see is very complex. But his comment is that nature uses only her longest threads to weave her patterns. So each small piece of the fabric re reveals the organization of the entire ta tapestry. You can sort of see the universe in a, in a grain of sand, if you will. That's kind of getting at that. Next, please. So that's my conclusions. Um, by performing a very carefully crafted fundamental physics experiment on the ISS, um, NASA can answer some of the most challenging questions that, that humanity is facing today. And these insights may profoundly change our view of nature and our role in it and lead to really unimaginable technologies that we, we can, can't even dream about today. All atoms are created equal, and they actually have built-in clocks in them by the hyperfine transitions and such. Uh, these atoms can be used as highly sensitive clocks, atom interferometers, and atom lasers with unprecedented accuracy. There's other people, uh, other agencies out there doing uh, similar research to us, so there's a great opportunity to collaborate. The European Space Agency really wants the U.S. to participate more strongly in this program, and, and we're trying to make that happen. Uh, the science mission directorate at NASA is doing some, op they're doing observational physics. But the physics they do, they're, it, they're really addressing the same kind of questions that we're targeting. And other US agencies have complementary ground-based research that, that really, again, is addressing the same kind of questions. And as I stated before, I think that today's, the, the fundamental physics that we do today, it really represents the foundation for tomorrow's breakthrough technologies. Thank you. Any questions?